So I'm here this morning to share with you a compelling and grand vision of global transformation. Now, I didn't ha hear a voice in the night and you know, I didn't have an angel visit. This vision was articulated in the New Testament by the most, I mean, the, 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 the greatest visionary of all time, namely Jesus Christ. The scripture records this vision in this way. We read in the book of Mark that when John had been put into prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel or the good news of the kingdom of God, saying, repent and believe the good news. That began a movement that has affected generations for over 2,000 years, beginning in Judea and then spreading throughout the entire world. When Jesus came, I mean, he taught a lot of things, but central to the message of his, central, uh, a central component of his message was this vision of a kingdom that Daniel chapter 2 tells us would, grind, be, be, would take up and take over all other kingdoms. So that's what I'd like. I'm simply here as a messenger to share with you in a small way what the Bible articulates about this great global transformation. It is a, a really grand vision of a much better world. It is a perpetual and has been an elusive goal down through time, a hope and vision afar off and yet still deferred. We have, I think as many have expressed, an area here and a, um, a site. Of course, there are a lot of places. I'm going to get, tell you a little family secret. So my daughter, Marianne, who some of you know, I mean, she'd been nipping at my ear and she said, Dad, you know, the way we keep these feasts at, you know, it, I think it was the year I went to Jamaica. She said, it, it, it's great, but I, I'm not sure it's biblical. I mean, this this... All this luxury, you know, in a tent, a temporary dwelling would really be a lot more authentic. Guess where she is? <laughs> nice, France. <laughs> I called her a few weeks ago, and I said, Marianne, there's someone I know, have a lot of respect for and love dearly that once told me, and you can fill in the gap. <laughs> you ought to be in Walnut Creek where it's authentic. <laughs> you know, we celebrate this vision during the Feast of Tabernacles, and we are commanded to celebrate today what only tomorrow can bring in its fulfillment. But I believe very deeply that we have to do and we need to do what we can with what we have where we are at. We see lions dwelling with lambs. Now, don't try that. I mean, that may not work out so well. We see men beating swords into plowshares. We see spears being transformed into pruning ho hooks. We meet children on the mountain leading straw-eating lions. Vegetarian lions. By the way, I'm a vegetarian. All the steak I eat were vegetarian cows. <laughs> I like that kind of vegetarianism. I grew up eating meat and potatoes and not much has changed. It's worked for me. And it's a transformational vision of global proportions. We can take it to the bank. It's going to happen as sure as I am standing here. But there's a catch. There are a number of catches. We'll look at a couple of them, and I don't have time. Well, they told me I have a lot of time, right? Everybody, I'll just follow in the footsteps of everybody that's gone before me. They just took their time, right? They just took their time. The catch is this. It does not begin a vision grand. 
The millennium begins a broken world when Jesus Christ returns, not a vision grand and peaceful. Hence, the title of this message is this. Global Transformation, Building or Rebuilding a Broken World. You know, that goes right back to what I opened up with. Jesus said, repent and believe the good news. You know, repent and believe are some of those words that, you know, kind of lost their impact and meaning just because it's been overused. So let me substitute for a moment, if I may, those two words. Let's replace repent with the word change and the word believe with act. We're only going to be able to rebuild a broken world by implementing change. Because nothing changes unless something changes. And usually change only occurs when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of staying the same. That's usually how pain how change occurs, and there's going to be a lot of pain prior to rebuilding a broken world. The millennial kingdom of God begins a broken, not a transformed world. It begins a land that is laid waste. I'd like to just share with you a couple snapshots. Let's go to Revelation chapter 16. You know, some of these scriptures are, are shocking but not unrealistic. Some of these things, not what I'm about to read, but you know, some of the cataclysmic events that are described by John. And John, John I believe, I mean, this is, I, I, I preface it by saying I believe. I believe John saw, and this will date me in full technicolor, what is actually going to happen. It was just that he did not have the vocabulary to describe, you know, Black Hawk helicopters and the armaments that we have today. So he said they looked like grasshoppers and, and things like that. But take a look at chapter 16. And I'm just going to break into the um, passage here in verse 20 to look at one example. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, every hailstone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Now you can read across, uh, read by it and say, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, we've had a hailstorm. You know, I've seen, even in this area, hail destroy crops of corn. This is different. This is... It says here that every hailstone about the weight of a talent. A talent is 75 pounds. That'll do some damage. That's why, I mean, it's just one example. I'll cite a couple of others. If you go to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 19, let's go there. Um, we, we, when, 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 we, when I say rebuilding a broken world, we're talking about a broken world. Isaiah chapter 2. And Isaiah chapter 2 starts out fine enough. I mean, it's basically the same. I mean, it's actually almost exactly the same as Micah chapter 4, you know, going up to the mountain of the Lord. But verse 19 says something different. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake earth mightily. In that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made, each for himself to worship to the moles and the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the crags of the rugged rocks for, from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. I mean, these are times unlike, you know, in Matthew chapter 24 where Christ says that there, was, there will be a time such as has never been nor shall ever be. 
If you know a little bit about history, it doesn't take a genius to recognize that that is going to be a very difficult time. So there's a catch. It doesn't start out, you know, looking like what we read and we will read um, later in the, in the message, Isaiah chapter 11. But there's another catch. And the other catch is a little bit more personal. And this is, this is, if you want to keep notes, this is point number one. Global transformation begins first with rebuilding a broken you. I mean, it's kind of like you and me, you and I, you know, and sometimes not sure about you, you know how that game goes, right? Job said, my spirit is broken. My days are extinguished. The grave is ready for me. Here's something I've come to. And I think, I think it is actually liberating. This is in, this saying is in Old English. We're all screwed up. It's just a matter of how and how much. And when you recognize that, it becomes a starting point for what Jesus called repentance. It just means to change. You know, change is one of those words, they're going to change something. And it's like, oh, where's this going? Change. Well, I have news for you. We're in for a big change. Remember what Paul said, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, we will all be changed. And it starts right now. The psalmist observed this, the Lord is near those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. We've all been there, haven't we? Everybody, everybody has their story. I'll share mine on the eighth day. You're never very far from tragedy and trouble because we live in a troubled world. Come with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, we'll read a couple of verses. If you want to be encouraged, read the book of Hebrews chapter 11. You know, Chronicles you know, it's the hall of faith, right? Read all the names. Write them down. And then go read about their lives. They were all screwed up. They all had problems. They were all broken. But God rebuilt them. And great, transform great transformative acts were accomplished by these individuals. God is able to do amazing things through people who are yielded to him. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. <clears throat> but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, and even the righteousness of God which is through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. And he's writing to the Romans. There was no, the, 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 the brokenness of humanity is consistent across all nations and ethnic groups. And here's why. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. How did, how was, you know, you think about it, why was Paul able to articulate and write so well and so powerfully? Come with me to, to Acts chapter 9. Buckle up, we're going to cover a lot of scriptures and we're going to do it slowly. That's why you need to buckle up. I, I, I'd like to, if we could just, as we read this, and I'm going to read through the story because I think it is important, I'd like you to think about what would happen today if this happened in any church fellowship. You know, this, this, was, this was a transformation of a person that caused all kinds of problems, <laughs> as we will read here, among the believers in Judea and in that area. Notice, chapter 9, verse 1, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus in Syria, so that if he found any who were of the way, it was described that the way of life that you and I profess and practice was called the way because it differentiated them because these people were different. They were transformed from cowards into public speakers and were able to look death in the eye fearlessly. It was a way of life. Of those of the way, whether of men or women, that he may be bring them to, bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came to near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. I mean, that he, he used this powerful word, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, verse 6, so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I mean, this is almost word for word to the response in Acts chapter 2. And it's amazing, you know, at least, you know, we're talking about rebuilding me. When you get to the point where you say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Problems go away, and things open up, and some stuff, stuff begins to work. Paul said that. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. And the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but not seeing anyone. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. He had been blinded. He had something of the, the likes of cataracts on his eyes so he couldn't see. Now, this created, this created the other dilemma. You know, this is, you know, the Hitler of the New Testament out there uh, martyring people. And now, all of a sudden, in verse 10, now there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said, in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he may receive his sight. Then Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard uh, from many about this man and how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. So now the shoe is on the other foot. And here, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. God took a murderer of brethren, converted him, transformed him into a vessel that he called 
mine for the purpose of taking this grandiose vision of the gospel into the known world. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, laying his hands on him, and he said, I think I'd like to, I'd like to call to your attention what Ananias, who had just expressed his concern, what he told Paul. He said, Brother Saul. And could you do that? Could you call a man a brother that had just murdered men and women of faith? Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized and, he, and when he received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with disciples at Damascus. You see, when, when people get to the point of saying, what do I need to do? What, men and brethren, what shall we do? Things happen fast. And immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that he was the Son of God. And all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, so that he might be bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelled in Damascus. It was shocking. One thing I've come to this last year is I think we tend to romanticize Scripture. It was, a, it was just this neat party in Jerusalem. You know, the Lord was with them. Everything was fine. You know, they just had this church that they went to on the Sabbath with their little satchels and sandals, and it was all good. Gave each other hugs, you know. It wasn't that way at all. It's never been that way. When God interrupts the lives of a person, it becomes tumultuous. It becomes uncomfortable. If you're comfortable, you probably should be concerned. Change is uncomfortable. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. You see how tables turned. But their plot became known to Saul, and they let him down outside the wall. This is the same, this man murdered Christians came to be the, the predominant writer of New Testament scripture. It's an amazing story of transformation. And it tells us what should be actually a rational and logical conclusion, and that is you cannot transform a world if you don't transform people one at a time. I mean, that's how big things get done. That's the only way things get done, one at a time. I mean, even, even in my business, it's that way. You know, we have a small business. We ship over a billion parts a year, and people ask me, wow, a billion was a B. Yep, it's a billion. How in the world do you do that? One at a time. One. So the question is, if I want to rebuild me, let's talk about me for a moment. If I want to rebuild me through the grace of God, what does that look like? What does that look like for you? What is, what is the formula? Well, Paul gave us the formula, and, we'll, and this formula is scalable. Let's go to Romans chapter 12.
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, Paul writes, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Seems pretty unreasonable to me. But verse 2 has the formula. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I mean, that's a formulaic expression. Be not conformed to this world. I mean, I grew up listening to that passage in German. Stellet euch nicht dieser Welt gleich. Means the same thing, different language. The question of the how to walk that out was what was misguided. I could buy humility, it's really convenient, I could buy humility at Spectre's in Millersburg and Sugar Creek. Two specifications. I always say, you know, I, <laughs> I'm kind of a nonconformist. You know, um, I was in speech class once at Ambassador College. Some of you guys that went there, they had this thing called um, impromptu speech. But then to make it more interesting, they assigned a heckler. Yeah, just... Impromptu wasn't bad enough, so they designed hecklers to heckle you, which came in handy uh, in my life. It's been a very good skill set to have in automotive. And I also had a, I had a funeral once where people started heckling uh, because they were under the influence. came in handy. But anyway, I got assigned an interesting title. Um, it went like this. I was a married student, so what is it like to be a married student? Oh, okay, that's easy enough. I got up and said, well, as the title suggests, I am not the normal student. The heckler got up and said, he sure got that right. <laughs> kind of an odd duck. And if you want to be a nonconformist, if you want to follow the formula, you have to become, and you have to because Paul, the transfor transformed Saul, beseeches us all to do that. You know, being a nonconformist is kind of cool. You know, you paint your, your hair yellow and spike them and, you know, um, put um, hardware at all kinds of places in your body instead of the garage. I mean, there are all kinds of things today that you can, that you can do to be a nonconformist. But you know what really works? If you want to be an authentic nonconformist, try keeping the Sabbath and the holy days. That'll set you apart. That works, and it works everywhere, all around the world. Become a servant. A servant? You know, Jesus um, always had this conversation with the disciples. They were always worried about who's going to be the greatest. Feed the poor. Close the, take the stranger in. You know, go, go, I mean, you start doing those things, and you're not conforming to this world at all. You do it at an individual level. Number two of the formula is to be, transform, be transformed. You know, there, that's an interesting word here uh, in, in Romans uh, chapter 12, metamorphe. It's a Greek word that's only used, um, I think, three times in the New Testament. And it's talking about, you know, be transformed. Let, let, me, it's, let me share with you another scripture where this word is used. Come with me to Matthew chapter 17. Um, and um, we'll take a look at this. Matthew chapter four, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 17, I think I said 14, I meant 17. Verse 1, now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John 
his brother and brought them to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transformed, same word, transfigured, before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Now here, this is very similar language to Revelation. You know, there is both definitive and comparative language here. He was transfigured before them in his face, that's definitive, he had a face, shone like, comparative, the sun, and his crows clothes became white as white as the light. You know, it doesn't say that, you know, his, his, his face was not the sun, but the brilliance was the sun, was like the sun. And that's comparative language. But Jesus, in the transformed state, and this is important, had a face that was recognizable, both here and in the account in Revelation. That's the kind of transformation that is possible when we repent and believe, when we change and act. Point number three under, I mean, you go A, B, C maybe. This formula is, first of all, do not conform, be transformed, and renew your mind. I like the term renovating your mind. Make a renovation. Change how you think. And actually, you know, psychologists have shown that there are patterns and pathways in the brain. And we, we tend to think along certain pathways that we have habitually developed over time that either make us productive, healthy individuals, or if we have negative thinking, makes enslaves us. And you become very regimented and rigid. And some people struggle more with that than others. The formula for rebuilding a broken you is to renovate your mind. See how that's done. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. This is an echo of what we read in Romans. Paul wrote to the Philippians, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. We need to renovate our minds from the way of thinking that we have grown up with, that we've been modeled after, and you know, it's like a big renovation. A big renovation in your house, you tear things apart and you renovate it and make it the new, renovated, rebuilt room. And you know what's common in that? It's really messy. And analogy holds true when, when, you, when you are willing to get out of your comfort zone, it gets messy. And that's okay. And the reason it is okay, it is a, because you're following a, or I should say, the way that Christ inspired Paul to lay down in a formulaic way, and it'll get uncomfortable. I've been in some really uncomfortable situations in my life. But it caused change. You cannot change without becoming uncomfortable. You need to renovate. And let 
this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. What kind of mind? It's right here. Verse 1, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And then it describes it in detail. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. I mean, we, we live in a culture that elevates individualism, okay? Where everything is done in self-interest. I mean, that's just the expectation. The unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. The mind that was in Christ Jesus that we are to take on is quite the opposite. Let nothing be done with selfish ambition. Try that for a while. <laughs> if you want to be uncomfortable. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. It's called balance. You can't give what you don't have, right? Some people try that. Then you get into an abusive situation. And women out there, listen to me. You are not to be abused. You're to be valued. That is not lowliness of mind to be abused. Let each of you look out not for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Give what you can, generously from what you have, not what you don't have, because you, you're not authorized to give that. <clears throat> There's another um, place in the scripture where this um, is mentioned, this, this same Greek word which I failed to mention. Let's go to 2 Corinthians just quickly. I've got a lot of time. We've got all day. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 10. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, pulling down strongholds. You know, we, at the end of the day, a lot of battles are fought at a spiritual level by forces that are very real that are in the room and in the hearts and minds of people, but not visible. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You see, the global transformation occurs when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of, knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. That can only occur when it starts with you. So that you, in turn, like Paul did, can influence others. Never underestimate the power of influence. It's way more effective than the power of coercion. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Obedience? O obedience. That's um, an unpopular word. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. 
You know, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 talks about the fact that we have not been given a spirit of fear. You ever made a decision where you were afraid that if you don't do something, something else will happen? Those are fear-based decisions, and they rarely turn out well. I've made a bunch of them. I have, I have enough experience making fear-based decisions to have the data to show they don't turn out so well, right? So you were afraid. And here's the thing. If God has not given us an attitude, spirit, whatever you want to call it, of fear, then who did? It's a, you see, God's way just works. It is logical and rational, even though it may seem irrational, you know, some of the things that, that occur, like you take the conversion of Saul. That's not irrational. That was a direct intervention by God and transformed the person who responded in the right way and it, it just went to its logical conclusion. And the fact of the fact of the transformation and the greatness of that gave him the ability to influence people in ways nobody else would have been able to. But it's not irrational. It's not fear-based either. God didn't give us the spirit, a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's how we renew it. Global transformation continues second with rebuilding the broken family. Genesis chapter 29. You want to see a broken family? Here is one. I mean, you should make a movie of Jacob and all his wives. You, wouldn't, you really wouldn't have to make much up. Genesis chapter 29 <clears throat> Verse 15, Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? <laughs> Jacob smitten. <clears throat> there are fear-based decisions, and then there are decisions like this. You know. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate. That sounds pretty good until you look at the margin and it says they were weak. But Rachel, but Rachel, I mean, look at her. She, she was beautiful of form and appearance. And Jacob was smitten so much so that he offered to enslave himself for seven years. And then Laban conformed to the world and, and gave him Leah. I mean, he, he, he was a real trickster. Was, Jacob was a good servant. So Jacob ends up with Leah and the handmaiden because polygamy was the cultural norm. And you know, then after the next morning, um, they had a discussion, and, and Laban says, well, you know, it's not... Becoming in my country to give the older, the younger before the older, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, if you, if you let's let's have this festival for a week, and then I'll give you Rachel also. And so it happened, and and Jacob bargained for the love of his life, and he got four of them. And you go, oh my, you know, what a mess. And it continues down to this day. You see. Families are broken today. And the reason they're broken is we tend to conform to the world. Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger be before the firstborn. And polygamy was just having multiple wives was just the, the norm of the day. If you want to rebuild your family then don't conform to the world. Be transformed. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. See, 
Whether you're, you're rebuilding you or rebuilding your family, the formula is the same. I'll demonstrate that to you. We'll go through um, a couple of other one examples. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives. That's a novel idea. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. I mean, that's that you know, the, the question. I mean, this is in the context, and you want to have fireworks when it's not the 4th of July. You start talking to women about submission. You know. I'm not the smartest man around, but I'm sure not dumb either. Okay? But if, you know, if you read this, this is a whole section about submission. You know, what, what is more difficult, to submit to your husband or to submit to Christ and to love your wife as Christ loved the church? Try that one out. I mean, that's a, that's a transformation in thinking compared to what our cultural norms are today. But it will rebuild a family. We need to renovate our minds when it comes to marriage, societal norms, and gender identity. Husbands are to love their wives. Jacob did not. He says that. He loved Rachel. And wives are to submit. And like I said, that, that's a, a touchy topic. Submit. As it says here in um, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And that qualifier is important. You don't submit to abuse. As to the Lord. Point number three. Global transformation continues. Third was rebuilding, now I'm going to go where angels fear to tread, the broken church. Church is broken. And I'm, I'm just talking the larger, you know, I mean, there's the larger church. I was, I mean, that, that's widely recognized today. Um, and... You know, we, we, okay, this is John Miller's opinion now. So, like Mr. Stolle, some of you knew him, used to say, opinions are like belly buttons, everybody's got one. I have a belly button, so I'm allowed to have an opinion. I believe we are at the decrepit situation, societal situation today, because of the quote-unquote nominal church, if you want to call it that, passive, um, sleepy approach to things that happened, shall we say, beginning in the 60s. My dad, who just died in December, when he went to public school as a young Amish lad, the first order of business was to read a psalm. Well, no, the first order of business was the recitation of the Lord's Prayer. Now, we might say, well, that's really not what Christ intended. Okay, I'll give you that. And then they read from the book of Psalms. That's how all the, you know, the, the tough German tykes that grew up in this community started out their day. I mean, they did things like throw rocks at my Aunt Mary in the outdoor bathroom and busted her eye. And, and then they met the Board of Education, and it broke in two. I mean, justice was rendered quickly. But they started from a biblical perspective. Today, that's unthinkable. It's completely unthinkable. Then we had abortion. Fortunately, we had uh, some mitigation on that. But here's the thing. Professing Christians stood by and did nothing. And you know where we're headed? We're going to have to stand up individually when we no longer have a right to do so. It's our fault. If you want to transform a broken church, 
you start by not being conformed to this world. Doing the right thing is hard, not easy. <clears throat> the church has a singular opportunity, no responsibility to be nonconformist in a world that has redefined marriage, family, and gender identity. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers, so that they might have offices and rank and enjoy special positions. Is that what your Bible says? Did you look? Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. That's what my Bible says. I'm teasing, okay? These roles, Paul said, Christ himself established for the specific purpose of equipping the saints for the work of ministry, meaning to serve, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The measure. The, the Greek word here is metron, from which we get the modern uh, statistical terms like metric and measurement. And the metric by which we are to measure our effectiveness as a church, as individuals, is the fullness of of Christ. That's big. That we should no longer be tossed, no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men. You know, and you know, I, I appreciate being with a group of people that have been around a long time. Not tossed around by trickery of men and the latest twist and whims and you know, this is a way of life, not a theological intellectual exercise. That that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by which they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Truth in love. You could actually boil everything down to these two words. Truth is the entirety of the Bible. God is love. Jesus walked it out and gave, gave us an example. Final point. Global transformation continues with rebuilding broken nations. That's a big job. Let's go to Revelation chapter 18. But the formula is the same. Formula is the same, Revelation chapter 18. By the way, I know that we have a number of parents here um, who have taken their children's education into their own, own hands. My hat's off to you. I grew up, went to an Amish parochial school just down the road from here, and we just learned about reading, writing, and arithmetic. You get those basics down, you can pretty much figure out the rest. Teach your children the basics and teach them the word of God and they'll do just fine. <clears throat> Verse 
Verse 4. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. I mean, the call to not conform is continues a continual thread down through time in the Old and the New Testament. Just a couple pages over, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they who sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Verse 2, But the rest of the dead did not, uh, sorry, um, I skipped over here. They did not worship the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. It takes a thousand years to rebuild what man had destroyed. We're going to rebuild it one at a time. Our time is now. We got to get our ducks in a row, our house in an order, whatever colloquial expression that you want to attach to it, and get on the way. And get moving. It's time. Isaiah chapter 11. I want to take a couple of scriptures here, and, and, and you know, these are what we call the millennial scriptures. Just to show you how transformative the kingdom of God is. That's why it's, you know, the word gospel, again, it's one of those, it's a great word. It's an old English word that means good news. But it gets tired after the way, the way because it's been misconstrued so so many different ways. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. This is the quintessential millennial picture of transformation. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. Try that. You know, the, geezer, the geeslers are farmers, right? Don't try this at home. You know, we just, we just do this on television, right? <laughs> The leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and the little child shall lead them and the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. This is not poetic. I googled this last night and you get all kinds of com you know, the poetic picture. It's not poetic. This is, a proph this is prophecy. This is News being written in advance. This will happen. And it's in a, a physical example of the transformative power of God. Even in the animal kingdom. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand into the viper's den, and they shall not hurt nor destroy all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah chapter 34. Just a couple pages over. Uh, sorry, I, Isaiah chapter 35. You know, there are a whole bunch of them here we could read. You go to Israel today and then you read the scripture. I had a 10-day tour, a 10-day tour of Israel about 10 years ago. And the, the thing that kept playing in my mind was this. Just add water. Just add water. And of course, the Israelis have done that. They have engineered the most effective irrigation systems. They pioneered drip irrigation. And more than that, they figured out at what time in the morning you can drip, drip, drip to get the, the most use of your water. And it has transformed 
the nation, but it's bigger than that. The vision that Jesus Christ cast when he came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God in Galilee was way bigger than that. It was this. Verse 1, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. And they shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. So that's the physical, agricultural transformation, but it's global meaning it's all-inclusive. It changes everything. But it begins here. In the recesses behind our skulls where the battles are really fought. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fear-hearted, fearful-hearted, be strong, and do not fear, behold, your God will come with a vengeance and rec- with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. You know, when Jesus came, he did these things. You know, he read from the scroll of Isaiah in, in the synagogue. And one of the most transformative things for me when I toured Israel was in the Dome of the Book. I looked at a facsimile of the scroll of Isaiah in the dome where the, they have this nuclear bomb-proof vault where the original is in. And I thought, this is really, really interesting. I'm looking at the scroll, a copy of the scroll that predates Christ, from which he read, I mean, if you want to have evidence of the veracity of Scripture, that's it. <clears throat> It's a big vision. And it was cast by the greatest visionary of all time. His name was and is Jesus Christ. He is the savior of the world. He is the king to come. And he will come at that day and hour that only his father knows by his own uh, declaration. So I'm not really interested in hearing all kinds of grand series about the when. I'm interested, and so should all of us be, in what it takes to get on the way. The message is still the same. Repent and believe, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a global transformation. And it begins with you and I.